It is because the British and the Portuguese found themselves locked together in a very, very close relationship that neither was particularly happy with. I see. You know, in a sense that uh, the, uh, by default they ended up having to be each other's allies and supporting each other. So which but, era, which, which centuries are we talking about? I mean, we start, I mean, we, the, the relationship changes fundamentally but over time, but we start off really with the, uh, the uh, handover of Bombay in the, uh, in the 1680s. I think. To, uh, or Bombay, to, uh, from Portugal to, uh, to the uh, British, which was actually opposed vigorously by the uh, governor of Goa. Right. He, he was trying to persuade the uh, Portuguese king that this was a strategic mistake giving up Bombay because of it's important as a deep water port. But, because? Uh, Sorry? Because of it's important as a okay. deep water port. Okay. Um, Goa and Bombay are some of the best ports in the whole of the west of India. I think. So if you control those ports, you control import-export between the subcontinent and uh, the rest of the world. So it's uh, so control of the ports was very, very, was very important. So we had a, um, so it was an interesting, uh, it was an interesting relationship where they, they find themselves kind of in a, uh, in a sort of intimate relationship where they have to support each other, even though frequently the British just want to uh, invade Goa. Overlapping and conflicting interests? Overlapping and conflicting interests, but ultimately mutually reinforcing interests. I see. The challenge I think the Portuguese had, and this is the challenge that they've always had, was size. Portugal is relatively small. It always has been relatively small population terms. Starting with 2 million, to, 2 million in the 15th, 16th century? Yeah. When, in, when England probably would have been about 5 million. 5 million only? Yeah. I mean, everybody was small. I see. But England was you know, twice to three times the size of Portugal. Um, and it's, so it's, um, you know, it's worth remembering that this uh, imbalance did mean that uh, Portugal was never really able to control large swathes of territory. Uh, but uh, the British obviously were able to uh, mobilize troops, etc. So gradually as the British moved out of their beachheads and Calcutta and Bombay and Chennai, and gradually took control of much of the subcontinent. Large areas, vast areas. Uh, Portugal was not able to do so. Yeah. But Portugal then found itself having to deal with the British. I see. And uh, sometimes cooperating. So if we go to the uh, 19th century, where this cooperation was probably the most strong. For example? For example, I mean, the obvious one was the uh, construction of the port in what's now Vasco da Gama. Uh, that port, Marmagoa, uh, was constructed by British engineers. Really? Uh, Everyone talks about the railway, but the port... And, and the railway as part of yeah. that was, uh, part of the, was part of the port uh, process. And there, was also, um, there were also British, uh, British uh, pilots who were... Uh, responsible. There is a small church uh, overlooking uh, Vasco, uh, which is the only Anglican church in Goa. Called? St. Christopher's. Really? And it's, it's, still, it's still, a functional, um, still a functional congregation. I see. Very small, but when you go to it, the church itself, it's a classic uh, early 19th century English church. Really? Where, where is this now? Where is it at, Shirley? Up in Vasco, by the port. Oh, I see. Uh, literally, um, there's a sort of park area overlooking the port. Wow. And the, uh, the church is in that park area. Uh, and you can go in there and... Uh, it's, you know, it's small. I see. But, um, but it's... And it was linked to... It was the church that was linked to the uh, English graveyard. Uh, in Dona uh, In, in Dona yeah. I see. So it's a... Um, so it's, it played a role and it was 
the legend, the, the architecture says that it was built a bit later, but the, they claim the history that their, uh, the building was built by the British troops uh, who occupied Goa in the 1790s I see. Uh, to oppose Napoleonic threat. There's a lot of confusion over that date, no? Yeah. The British moved in in 1798. Thank you. And then, uh, then left in about uh, in sort of uh, 1803 and then came back again in 1804. And then left in um, round about 1813. Wow. So that was the period. So roughly speaking, 1798 to uh, to 1813. Although towards the end, the British presence was very very small. The last two three years. At what point, Michael, did the did the British overtake the Portuguese? Is there some point we could put our finger on? It's difficult to say. Um, I would probably... This is, this is the I library where you can pick up free books, okay? Oh, oh yeah. Uh, it's open, you can just oh, open it yeah. and take it. Uh, Excellent. Yeah. This is where the food bank is. Yeah, the food bank also. Donald is Good. from yeah. Saligong. So. Yeah. Sorry. So he does the two things together. Yeah. Is he doing the books, is he? Uh, he just started on books and... Uh, Excellent. Uh, a few months back. And it's like you pick up and you return and those oh, kind of things. Yeah. Sorry. No, that's, that's good. No, that's good. No. And uh, yeah, and now it should be said that we're uh, going along Chogam Road. Chogam Road, Chogam Road, talking Chogam of, Road. Talking of uh, talking of the story of the British, because, right? Uh, almost the last story, the last bit of the British relationship uh, was the visit of Margaret Thatcher in '83. To, in '83, yeah, when when the uh, when we had the uh, Commonwealth heads of government. So you have your own take on it, which no one else uh, yeah. talks about. Well, I mean, the fun bit about that was that Margaret Thatcher nearly did not come to Goa because this was just after the... Uh, That's after a very surprising story. Of course, I've heard it before yeah, from you, so yeah. so I'm not surprised, but but I was when I heard it the first time. Absolutely. Uh, but the documents are there. I mean, the documents I, are there? The documents are there. I've got it. I've got literally... Copies? Copies of the documents where the Foreign Office is desperately trying to persuade Number 10 Downing Street that she should go to the um, retreat and the retreat and go up. So she didn't want to go on the principle that it was its status was. Uh... Well, she was she was arguing that because um, the Falklands War had just happened, yeah. where the British had defeated the 82, Argentinians, 82. Uh, trying to uh, occupy um, the Malvinas well, Falklands. The Malvinas Falklands. Falklands and this was seen as being a uh, parallel. She saw maybe this as a parallel for 61 and the invasion of Goa in 61 so the um, so yeah there was so so what she planned on doing was not make a fuss about it yeah but just simply uh, when, the, when the retreat when the retreat left yeah. for um, because the main main, main event meeting was in Delhi yeah. it was in Delhi so it's just the retreat that was in Goa right. and uh, she she planned on just ensuring that uh, she would just go somewhere else to see some tourist sites. To see some tourist sites uh, that weekend and would not attend. Okay. So the um, so then the mass the massed forces of uh, the British Foreign Office, uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and also the Commonwealth uh, Secretariat. Secretariat combined to try and persuade her to stay. And essentially, what helped ultimately her to decide to. Uh, come to Goa was the fact that the Portuguese government themselves had in 75 recognized Goa to be right. part of India. Right. So the argument was that there was not any conflict any conflict because the Portuguese had said yes we agree. Yeah. Uh, so but then on the basis of having looked at that that made me have to look back at the uh, at the files for 1961 and liberation and there the British were very very uh, un unsure of what to say what to do what, what to do in a sense the uh, India caught between, caught between caught, two friends caught between two very close friends very close friends uh, so uh, so some of it was fairly simple for instance uh, sorry some of it was fairly simple in the sense okay. that the British were able to say very firmly no there was no security guarantee to go there was a security guarantee through NATO to 
Portugal, but that NATO did not cover Goa because it was out of theatre. Out of theatre? Um, out of theatre, as in not geographically. Part, geographically not part of the North Atlantic. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So therefore, um, therefore the, uh, the mutual defence aspect of NATO didn't kick in. Um, which was the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation. Yeah, North Atlantic Treaty Organisation, which of course still exists. But, um, yeah. but anyway, so going and uh, what happened was that the, um, the British in the end recognised Goa de facto which means in fact, in fact, but not in law. Not de jure. Not de jure. Uh, so <laughs> up and so from the 19 from 1961 to uh, 1975, no British official ever entered really? Goa. I see. Officially, I they see. might have gone on okay. holiday, but okay. but no British official ever conducted a state visit. I see. Uh, to Goa. There were no consular offices. You were mentioning the release of documents, uh, Michael. Yeah. It happens fairly routinely in Britain without, oh, yeah. without yeah. too much of a fuss. Without any fuss. How many years? Uh, 30 years for all documents. And then where do you access it? Uh, the National Archives, the UK I National see. Archives. So you can go, so 30 years uh, conveniently gets us into the, uh, the wow. 1980s now. So. Uh, 1990s. Into 1990s even, yeah. So, um, so we can get the documents from that period. India is quite cagey about that because uh, the latest I saw was we had something in the 30s, you know. Yeah. There are British documents released about... Uh, it's all, some of these are searchable online. Yeah. And you find some stray references to Goa, but they are very stray references about yeah. some cook yeah. being caught up in some petty crime or something like that, you know. Yeah. No, no, I mean, you have some Goa documents, but... In Britain? In, in Britain, but essentially all of the India Office Archive is in the UK. Now, the India Office Archive should have gone to India and Pakistan. Till 47, you're saying, the 47 stuff? In 1947. Okay, okay, okay. So all the documents up to 1947. I see. But the problem was, because uh, neither India nor Pakistan could agree on a location for the documents. I see. Uh, the India office remained actually as a um, as a building in in um, in London until about 20 years ago. And then? And then they uh, then they, uh, the archive was handed over to the British National Library. I see. So the British Library, which is in uh, St Pancras uh, in London. And free for anybody to enter. Okay. SSG is the UK National Archive, which is in Kew Garden, which is in Kew in um, South West London. That's an interesting point, but I think here because of the noise, we, we've uh, come out of the Chogam Road. Yeah. So we'll, have, we'll also conveniently end the interview, but this is an ongoing conversation. Yeah. It's very interesting and looking forward to much more. Cheers. Thank you, thank you for your time. Thank you.